Riemann rock spaces, which were defined like this using divisors, talked about the dimension of such spaces, and there also exists a similar concept for differentials. Uh, there's a sort of omega space of a, of a divisor, where you just pick out all differentials satisfying a similar inequality. So just note that the G here is on the other side of the inequality side. Uh, and then uh, the thing is, the reason I didn't mention yesterday is that actually you can uh, see an isomorphism between these two using a canonical divisor because what you can do is any function f here you can map to f times this fixed differential and then uh, you get an isomorphism of these two spaces. So the dimension of such spaces is just the same as for a certain L space. And then what we saw was this theorem by riemann roch which gave an expression for the dimension of this L space. So it says that it's equal to 3 plus 1 minus the genus and then plus the L of W minus T. Okay, now with this isomorphism in mind, you can now also see that this is actually just the dimension of omega zero, which means the dimension of the space of all regular differential forms. Okay, so <coughs> now what does all this have to do with coding theory? So there is a, by now, famous construction by Vladimir Kopa, where he connects these two distinct worlds. Yeah, so I'm going to uh, explain what this construction is explicitly in a moment, but maybe it is first good to take a small step outside of this and first see what is actually going on in coding theory. So let me go back to this construction in a moment and first talk a little bit about coding theory in a very short way. So what I want to do is I want to set the table a little bit to appreciate this construction up there. So what is a code? So it is for now, just going to be a subvector space of some fq to the n. Yeah, we pick some n, we pick a finite field fq, and a code is just going to be uh, a subspace of this. And uh, the point is that we're going to use a little bit more structure. So what we will do is. We can make this into a metric space by defining a distance between two vectors. So what we do is that if we have two elements in the vector space, so say, just to be sure, we have some coordinates a1 up to an and the same for b, we have certain coordinates and what we do then is we define the distance between these two to be the number of distinct coordinates. So this is, uh, this is called the, the, the Hamming distance. And uh, using this you can create a notion of distance in this fq to the n. And uh, <coughs> the game with coding theory is now to, given a c, we have to determine the following. So uh, first of all we have, let me just define that, its length, which is simply this n we have fixed. Okay, then we have its dimension, 
which is just uh, probably denoted by k. But more importantly, really using that we have this, this Hamming metric is going to be so-called minimum distance. And that is going to be the following, where we have d is the minimum over all code words, all elements from C, distinct, and then we compute this having distance between them. So these are the important concepts for codes. Yeah, it's length, it's dimension, and it's minimum distance. And if you want to abbreviate all that, we just say that the C is an NKD code. If you really want to emphasize what finite field we have picked, you can put that as an index. That is sometimes common. Yeah, so, so this is really the game we play. So I will in a later lecture come back a little bit to do uh, what, what this has to do with applications because these are also called error correcting codes. So there is a, a reason for these definitions, namely that we want in some kind of data, data transmission scheme, we want to be able to correct errors. Yeah, so this is where this D comes in. I will come back to that uh, later. So for now, the important thing is, this is just a mathematical game. Yeah, so what we can ask is, given a finite field of Q, given N, given K, what is the best possible D? And this is, uh, is an unknown, uh, it's an unsolved problem in general. So what we can say in general is, well, uh, given N and K, there are bounds. Yeah, so you can give upper bounds for D using theory, you can give lower bounds on D using explicit constructions or existence results, but the real answer is not known. Okay, so... There's one more thing I may uh, remark here that uh, translations in this vector space are actually isometries. This is just a complicated way of saying that uh, we can simplify this expression somewhat by just defining the Hamming weight of one vector to be the distance from zero. Yeah, so let me just put the bar so it's not it's really a vector there. So, this just means the number of non-zero elements. Yeah, and then we may simplify this by using this uh, isometric property we have, that we can just take the minimum over code words, not zero, and just compute what is called the Hamming weight. So, this makes it a slightly easier to compute the minimum distance. Okay, so keep in mind what we want somehow is given n and k, we would like this minimum distance to be big. So let us come back now to what Goppa did in the 80s. So, what, what do we have? So as input, we take a function field, f, with full constant field, some finite field with q elements. And we have the genus, as before, denoted by g of f. Now, the next ingredient is that we will need rational places. So, so we choose 
n distinct rational places and it is customary just to put them in the, into the divisor d the notation they are just the formal sum of these places yeah that's the second ingredient and then the third ingredient is that we have to choose a divisor Now, just for the sake of simplicity, it's not strictly necessary, but we assume that for all i, this pi does not occur in G. Yeah, which just means that the coefficient of pi in this divisor G is just zero. But that's just to, to ease the, the theory a little bit, it's not necessary. Now there are some remarks to be made here, so before I go on, so the, this choice of function field, well, it's not so clear what a good function field is, but this n is not, not chosen randomly, this is going to be the length of the code later. So it depends on what we want this length to be, what kind of function field we need to choose. But now let us just see what kind of codes we are going to define. So, there are two constructions. The first one is by evaluation. So what we do is we evaluate functions in all these rational places. Like this. And the second construction is that we compute uh, residues of certain differentials. by evaluating functions from an L space in these rational places, the second one is to compute residues of certain differentials. And uh, so first of all note that uh, because these p's do not occur in the divisor G, this is really well defined, we do not have poles there. And also here, so allowing, so writing a minus t here is necessary because otherwise these residues would always be zero. So here also we get a non-trivial construction. Now, the important thing is now what about these basic parameters? So what about these n, k and d? Yeah, so let me just denote this by say it is an n, k, l, d, l code. And for this code, let us just now introduce the notation k omega d omega. So I didn't do anything, just introduce names for the dimension and the minimum distance of these two codes. I'm sorry, I'm still confused. In the second case, you are allowing your differentials to have poles along g. No, no, no. No, no, but no, no it's no. because this is on this side. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry, yeah. we have that thing reversed. Okay. Yeah. Alright. Yeah. She's just any device. Any device? Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, so in fact. Uh, it might have, might already have both. In the so it may have anyway, but it doesn't matter. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Yeah. By the way, what's the first the values of n and k for which the best thing is not known? <laughs> Ah, I don't know by heart. Uh, there are many, there are many. You don't have to go very uh, far up. So basically the only case where it is known is either you got lucky and the upper bound was constructible in some way, or it's a computer search. So, so as soon as it's out of bound of that, it is not known. But uh, I cannot give you an exact number.
So, what about this dimension and this minimum distance? So, let us start with uh, this, this k of l. So, the dimensions are the easiest, but uh, let us see. So, what are we really doing? So, we are essentially looking at some kind of evaluation map. Yeah, so, what we are looking at is we have a certain evaluation map from l of g to fq to the n where, well, this f is sent to this coverage, f p1 up to pn. Yeah, so uh, the question is simply, what is the, the dimension of the image? So in other words, this kl is going to be the dimension of this space minus the dimension of the kernel of this evaluation map. Now, but what does it mean to be in the kernel of this evaluation map? It just means that this f has a zero in all these rational places. Yeah, so it just means that you are in the L space g minus p1 and so on minus pn. Or, this is one of the reasons to introduce this d, that you are in the L space of the divisor g minus d. Yeah, so this is exactly the dimension. Now, similarly, if we look at this k omega, so we have some kind of residue map here from omega g minus d to fq to the n, sending a differential to this, uh, this uh, pair of residues, this n tuple of residues. So, what happens then? Well, it's going to be the dimension of this space, okay, I erased it by now, but there was an isomorphism with a certain L space, so the dimension of this is the same as the dimension of the L space of a canonical divisor minus this. And then we have to subtract the kernel of this mapping. Yeah, but what is the kernel of this mapping? Well, it will mean that all these residues have to be zero. That is the kernel of that map. But, <coughs> now look here, we only allow to call the order one or less. So if the residue is zero, that actually implies that it does not have any poles at, at, at this, these rational places. Oh, but G or G to G and D are disjoint. They are disjoint, yes. So th that simply means that uh, this minus d can be removed. Yeah? So that you are, if you are in the kernel of this residue map, you are in this omega g, and the dimension of that is L of w minus g. Okay, so uh, this is a, if you look at these two expressions here, computed just now, that, uh, well, th this may sound, or, or at least give you a uh, remembrance of this riemann rock theorem. Yeah, so in fact, what is going on here is that if you add these two numbers together, so let us see what happens. Yeah, so if we pair these numbers up in the right way, if we pair these two up, Yeah, and then we take uh, minus, let's see what is the best, take this one here. Like this. Yeah, that's the same. So what happens here? Well, according to the theorem of riemann rock this is just the degree of g plus 1 minus the genus. And then we get minus, yeah, a similar thing, the degree of g minus d plus 1 minus the genus. So you see what happens, that this cancels and this simplifies, because the degree of g will also drop out, so what you are, what you are left with in the end is simply the degree of this d, which was n, the number of rational places. And so these two constructions, this evaluation construction and this residue construction, they have complementary dimension.
Now that suggests that maybe, if we look at it in the right way, it's one is the orthogonal complement of the other. But then we have to, to know what that means. So let us introduce an inner product on Fq to the n. So let us define an inner product. And what we do is just what you would do if you are thinking of the real numbers. We just take the coordinate wise product of two vectors. So let us define this inner product now on Fq to the n. Now if we do that, let us now see what happens. Yeah, so let us now pick a crossword C from this CL. Well, let me write it as A anyway. And let us pick another crossword from this C omega construction. Like that. So let us compute or try to compute what the inner product is going to be. Okay, so we have to take the summation of the coordinate-wise product. Yeah, so the code word here from this CL, VG, will be of the form F of PI, the i coordinate at least. And this we multiply with the residue at PI of some differential. Yeah, what we then know is that this F is from LG, and this omega is from omega g minus d, like this. So what happens now? Well, let me just write what's going on here. So I'm claiming that this is just the sum of residues of f times omega at pi. Now you have to think a little bit here, because this is certainly not going to be true for general functions f and differentials omega. But again, the key is that omega has a pole of order at most minus 1. Now, so if this would happen to be 0, then in the product there would be no pole left anymore. But this is also 0. Now, if this is non-zero, it doesn't affect the pole order, and it's still true. Yeah, so that, that you have to realize that. Now what happens now? So this f times omega is now going to be from this omega minus d. By, by definition, by choice of f and omega. So this means that the only poles this differential f times omega may have are among those rational places. p1 up to pn. This means that I'm, in fact, taking the sum of all the residues of this differential f times omega here. Yeah, that means that by the residue theorem, we get zero here. So, under this notion of inner product, we get uh, we will simply get that one is the dual of the other, as it's called. It would be better to say orthogonal complement, but common language is to say that uh, this code is the dual of that one and vice versa. Okay, so this connects these two different constructions in a very explicit way. Now, I may also mention that uh, if you do not like one of these constructions, you can avoid that. So what I mean to say is that it is possible to pick a divisor H such that this is actually going to be the CL of D, H for a suitably chosen divisor. So it is possible to avoid it altogether, but uh, in my experience it gives much more insight to have both constructions. Okay, so that is the first uh, result on, on behavior of these codes. But now let us see what happens with the minimum distance. <coughs> so for the minimum distance, we, we really have a very similar trick. So what are we going to do? Well, 
okay, we are picking a code word from this CL code. And let us suppose that the having weight of this C is actually the minimum distance. Yeah, so what does it mean? It means that this code word has DL non-zero coordinates. So it has N minus DL zero coordinates. And that is simply by definition of this Hamming weight, or this Hamming distance up there. Okay, so let us see, can we now exploit this? Yeah, so this C is of the form, yeah, it's an evaluation of some function f for Lg by definition. And uh, now we have additional information on this function. So it means that yeah, we, we need to give this, uh, these coordinates some name. So we have that for this particular f, fpi is 0, for l minus dl indices. Let me just write the numerator. So we have i1 up to i n minus dl. So there are n minus dl indices such that this function is zero. So what does that mean? Well, just as before, when we were talking about the kernel of this evaluation map, we can now say more. We can say that this function is from L of g, yes, but we can do more. We can subtract these n minus dl rational places. Okay, I get it. Like this. Yeah, so this is just adding the information that this function vanishes. Okay, yeah, so now what do we have here? So we have an element from this L space. Yeah, and, and since the weight of this code that was dl, this c is not zero. Yeah, so it's not a zero uh, code word, so this f is not a zero function. So what do we get? Yeah, the degree of this divisor has to be non-negative. Okay, because it was worth that was one of the things I mentioned last time, if this degree would be negative, this, this L space would be trivial, only zero. Yeah, so this translates into a lower bound on this minimum distance. Yeah, these are rational places, so they have each degree 1, and this we just leave as it is. So what we get is that this minimum distance, this dl, is at least n minus the degree of the divisor. That is the, the outcome. that you can actually have a very general construction where you have a lot of choices and you can say this about the minimum distance. And uh, I'll leave to you to check that you can also prove a bound for this the omega. It is 2g minus 2. You see. So this is at least the degree of the divisor minus this 2g minus 2, so like this. And it's done in a very similar way, very similar reasoning. So also here we have 
uh, an a priori lower bound on this minimum distance. Now, okay, so what makes this so uh, powerful is that uh, under certain assumption, So just putting this assumption on the degree of this divider G for now, turns out that if you put everything together, you get the following results. And uh, so, so this condition is just so that some of these dimensions uh, are easy to compute. I'm not saying this is not true otherwise, but certainly true here. So, so we have this basic inequality for algebraic geometry codes. And this, this yeah, if you know a little bit about coding theory, there's something called uh, the singleton bound, which reminds a little bit which, which looks like this result, because that says that for any code, we have actually this. So, so this, this is a linear algebra bound, very easy to prove. So, so this is a very, for all codes, and here we have this for these special AG codes. So we see that in this sense, it's optimal in some sense, so they are called MGS codes, if we have equality there. And these algebraic geometry codes are not too far from that. And in fact, if the genus is zero, you get equality automatically. So, uh, so what, what to think then of this result here? It means that if the genus is small, they are close to being optimal in this sense. If the genus gets larger, yeah, well, we have to remember from last time this uh, Hasselweier bound and these asymptotic bounds. If the genus gets large, we can make this n very large without changing the finite field. So it's kind of a trade-off what we want to do. So I'm going to, uh, to think more in the asymptotic sense. So what I'm trying to do now is to see what happens if I hold my finite find field fixed, fq is fixed, but I'm trying to let this n tend to infinity by choosing function fields properly. Yeah, so what did I, uh, I have last time? So I, I had this result. About Nihara's constant, which was the lim sub of g tending to infinity of n1 of f over the g of f, that this was known, is computable, this is equal to root q minus 1 if q was a square. Yeah, and otherwise we only had an upper bound. But let us now say, okay, I'm going to look at the case where I know exactly what's going on where I know the house constant explicitly. Okay, now let us see. Yeah. So let us see what happens. So in the first place, let us take this equation again and uh, divide by the length, so divide by n, then we get the following expression, it's larger than or equal to 1 minus g of f over n, and then there is this 1 over n left. Now, so if you want to make the length as long as possible, we had better choose all possible rational places. So this n I'm really going to choose to be the set of all rational places. 
Now that's the best we can do. So what happens in this case is that we recognize that this term here is the same, but just flipped, as in the definition of the Haas constant. So it means, using that result, So we can choose a family of function fields and let's say fi, i larger than equal to zero all with full constant field fq <coughs> such that is 1 over root q minus 1. So therefore we can we can construct Satisfying, well, we're going to define R as the limit of K over N. So, yeah, so a family of pros, let me just add a little bit here. So, Ni, uh, well, we know what that is, that's N1 of Fi. Here we're going to choose Ki, and here we have some minimum distance Di. Okay, so what can we now construct? Since we can choose this dimension rather freely by picking our divisor, we can make sure that this converges to R, I already wrote it. The second is that we can just define delta to be the limit of this di over n1fi. But then the thing is that from this result here we get that R plus delta is larger than or equal to 1 minus 1 over root q minus 1. 1 over this a of q, the Haas constant. And this is the, the, the main result in this asymptotical game. So the special thing is that our finite field is fixed, and then we can construct a family of codes with a certain length, I mentioned a minimum distance and the relative length k over this n1 tends to r. The relative minimum distance we can let tend to a delta and this satisfy this inequality. So this is the, the, the main thing here. So let us see then if this is really an impressive result or not. It stands as it is, but uh, the question is, is this uh, interesting for coding theorists? Now, this question of constructing a family of code where the length tends to infinity, and nonetheless we get here an r and a delta, uh, which are not both, uh, which are not zero, that is be, that's an old game in coding theory. So, so this is called an asymptotically good family of codes. This has been well studied in the sense that people try very hard to construct such families of codes. And it is also known for, for a large quantity of codes that, uh, uh, that they are asymptotically bad in this sense. So this, this is a game that is interesting for coding theories. So if we see now what is known, so let me just look at explicit existence results. So what is known is that there is a curve here, something like this. 
and, and, and you can construct families of codes, like here, such that the rate, as it is called, the k over the n, tends to some r, the relative minimum distance, the d over n, tel, tends to some delta, and then on this curve here. And this is a, a result known by Hilbert independently far -shan. So this is uh, an explicit construction. I'm uh, not going into detail how to do it, but there is a way to get on this curve. Now if we compare that with what happens here, this r plus delta is larger than 1 minus this constant, it, it means that we are somehow here on a line with slope minus 1. And now it really depends on the q if the result is interesting or not. So if the q is small, uh, q is 2 for example, this is a very bad result compared to this. But as q gets bigger, this result gets better, because this factor here is going to become smaller. And it turns out that if q is larger than or equal to 49, then this line will really intersect this other curve here, so in, in two points, meaning that there is some interval where this result is better. And this is the, the this was a landmark result in the 80s for AG codes. Now the truth is that despite the fact that a lot has happened and there have been many developments, this is still the best known. Well, it's not completely true. There are some constructions where this line is, is moved a little bit up, but they heavily depend on algebraic geometry as well. So for, for these values of q, yeah, and q is square, I should say, otherwise we don't know what the half constant is, <coughs> then this is still uh, the best that's known in, in that sense. So this is theoretically theoretical result that's still extremely appealing. Okay, so I have 12 minutes left. So I, I want to, to talk a little bit about uh, how you can show that this result holds. So I'm just going to, to use the time I have now to uh, talk about that. And then uh, next time I will start. Yeah. Yes. You said earlier that you wanted codes where the minimum distance was large. Yes. But you just proved the minimum distance plus r is large. So yes. you also get delta r. Yeah, yeah, that's true. So uh, but if the r is, say, 0, mm -hmm. that, that means that uh, uh, the, the k is, is going to be negligible to n, as I'm told. Mm -hmm. And then it is actually easy to, to make delta large. So you can control r. So, so the, the real difficulty is in making this positive. Yeah, so the other, the other aspect of the game I mentioned was given n and k, what's the best possible d? Mm -hmm. But that, that's, that's a slightly different uh, game. Okay. Yes. Okay, so, so just, just to, to wrap up uh, how the algebraic geometry helps here. So the thing we need to show to make this work is this statement here, that the Hamas constant is root q minus 1 if q is a square. Now there have been uh, several proofs of this fact. So the first one by Ihama himself uses Shimura curves. So he uses rather reduction of Shimura curves to see that this is the case. He simply points at a family of such curves, reduces them, and then you get this result. If you don't know what those objects are, it doesn't really matter. I just want to give you a historical overview of what was happening here. Then, as I mentioned later, there was a later proof independently by Tsvassman, Vladut and Zink, where they uh, achieved the same result, and they used Grinfeld modular curves. And uh, after that, more explicit methods became uh, apparent. So I want to, to mention those methods. So you look a little bit doubtful. No, no, no that's it. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so 
So I want to mention a result by uh, Garcia and the Stichtenot. So what they did is point at a family of function fields achieving this uh, this constant explicitly. So they had the following results. What they made was not only a family of function fields, but it's actually extension, so the tower of function field, as they called it, and it defined in the following way. We start with a, a rational function field, just to emphasize that it's really a square cardinality that we just take as a constant field Q squared for now. And then after that, they defined in a recursive way what is going on here. So, so they defined the extensions that follow after F0 in a recursive way, in the sense that you obtain an equation relating the new variables to the old one, namely this one, and the special thing is that this relation does not depend on where you are in the tower. So it's only these indices that change in every step. But it's essentially the same relation you use over and over again. So they call this recursively defined towers of function field. This is an example of that. Yeah, so this is a very special kind of construction where you just have the same equation and you use it over and over. So essentially, all the information you want for this, this tower, all the computations should be uh, contained in this very small scheme, this small, I need to write that down. So everything you want to know is somehow contained in these three function fields. Yeah, you, you have these two variables, x0 and x1, and you have here a way to connect them, where the equation, of course, comes in. And this somehow contains everything. If you know this, you can run the iteration. So the question is really, what makes this equation tick? Why does this work? Now, once you have the equation, you can start analyzing it. You can start looking at what, what makes this really work. And it is very helpful to uh, draw a following picture, a pyramid of function fields. So let me drop the, the cube squared for now there. So what we have here, we have the tower which you get by adjoining variables and using this equation all the time. Now let me do one more. But you could also... look in other directions, like this. Okay, and it continues, it goes on. Yeah, so you have this pyramid of function fields. So we know how this triangle here works. We have the equation, and this triangle appears over and over again at the bottom. It is also iterated. So it is very helpful to think of this function field as the composite of these two, or of these three. So what, what do we need to know to, to see that we get the result on the Haas constant. Well, there are two things we need to be able to investigate. We need to know what happens with the genus, and we need to know what happens with the rational places. So, uh, there are these two things we need to know. So let's see if we can at least shed some light on this. So what I'm going to do is I, I pick an element alpha, so I'm again looking at this 
triangle up there, and I pick an alpha, and it satisfies that alpha to the q plus alpha is not zero, and alpha is from fq squared. Now, just looking at this equation, this defining equation, let me write it here again. So what this means is, if we put it in here, yeah, since it's this is not zero, in particular, alpha is not zero. So, in fact, what we get here is definitely going to be a non-zero element again. So, in fact, what we are trying to solve here, if we put in such an alpha there, we're trying to solve a similar equation again, satisfying this condition again. So the next variable, let's say beta, will actually then have to satisfy beta to the q plus beta is non-zero again. And if you analyze this a bit more carefully, you will also see that this beta is again in fq squared. Yeah, the reason is that if you would multiply with x0 in, in the numerator and denominator, here you get a norm from fq squared to fq, and here you get a trace. So this is actually going to be a non-zero element of fq. Yeah, and then solving trace is equal to an element in fq will have all its solutions in fq squared again. Yeah, so, so this set of alpha satisfying these two conditions is an invariant. Yeah, so if you start iterating this equation, you will see that all the coordinates, all the values of x0 and x1 and x2 and so on, they will always lie in this set. And that is the key to the number of rational places. So what it means is by iterating this construction, so let me just, yeah, so we get the gamma there, again <coughs> satisfying these conditions. Etc. So what it means is that the number of rational places of this function field fi is going to be at least the cardinality of this set, which is q squared minus q, times the extension degree. Okay, and in fact all these extension degrees and every step this is going to be q, and this continues all the way up. So this extension degree is actually just q to the power i. Yeah, so this, this is one invariant that, uh, that helps you out here. Yeah, to control the genus, we have to use a, a little bit of theory that I haven't explained to you, but I'm going to uh, mention it anyway. So to control the genus, we have to study these extensions carefully, and especially we need to know where the ramification occurs. Because if you know the ramification, then you can use the Hurwitz, uh, Riemann Hurwitz genus formula. So that is the key to computing the genus of these function fields. So now if we look at where this extension is uh, ramified, now it's an Artes-Eyer extension, so we need to know where this has poles. So for an Artes-Eyer extension, the only ramified, possibly ramified places are the poles of this function. Yeah, so you see here that the poles are coming in when uh, this is zero. So. Yeah, or let me just uh, write it a bit sloppy, we have the place at infinity. Yeah, because then this function will also have a pole. So we have those two cases uh, where in the first step we have ramification. But that's not enough because that will allow us to compute the genus of the first one, but we want to go all the way up. And if we want to do that, we have to see also where in the next step you get ramification and so on. 
And this could explode. Yeah, this could mean that if you look at the places down there that ramify somewhere in this tower, this could be from an infinite set. But this is a kind of a second kind of invariant set that we have here. It turns out that the only thing that happens is that, well, alpha is zero. It's not ramified in the first step, but later on it's going to ramify. But that's it. Yeah, so this is a finite set again. That is, that is also very special. Yeah, and then using this and uh, the riemann horowitz formula, it turns out you can control the genus also in, in uh, great detail. There are some technicalities you have to take care of because uh, the ramification here is, is going to be wild. So you have to do more work than, than you may have been used to if you look at uh, uh, all the complex numbers of characteristic zero because they are all ramification is tame and easier to handle. Here it is wild, but nonetheless you can, can handle that. And it turns out that, that the genus also is proportional to the extension degree. And uh, then, then going to the limits, it turns out that you get exactly the right thing. Yeah, so, uh, the outcome of the computation is this, and that, so I can make it a little bit more precise, just than this one to the plus one. And then taking these two in combination, you see that this quotient will uh, tend to at least Q squared minus Q over Q, which is Q minus 1. But according to the Drinsel Fladers bound, you cannot be, do better, so equality holds. So that is, uh, that, is that, that explicit result. Okay, I see I'm out of time, so I'll stop here. So, yeah, yeah, certainly. So, uh, there are many possible distances one could investigate. Having distance is the easiest one. So, there are other things like uh, the Yes? Why, please? There's a question. Why, please? Yeah. Yeah. But, but okay. But the, the the bounds on the minimum distance only depends on the degree of the divider. So you can just pick anything. Any yeah. Yeah. Doesn't become someone else's. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Good question. Okay. More questions. Okay. Thank you.